Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts Thursdays at the Museum program. I'm Amanda Harrison, a Community Engagement Manager for the DIA. Today, we're discussing Seeking the Sacred, an in-depth look on religious works. During the program, I want to encourage you, as always, to please ask questions. To do so, leave a comment on this Facebook post or leave a public comment on our YouTube page. Be sure to log into YouTube using your Gmail account. Christine Mark, our manager of volunteer development, will be taking your questions throughout the program. And here to take you on this virtual tour are trained docents, Kathleen McBroom and Deb Coombs. Welcome, ladies. How are you? We're great. Hi, Amanda. How are you? How are you doing, great. Kathleen? You? It's great to be back. Hi, Deb. How are you today? Wonderful. Great. Well, Amanda, thank you so much. Um, as Amanda said, today our topic is Seeking the Sacred. We're going to be looking at different pieces of art that incorporate elements of religion, um, spiritualism, various belief systems. We're going to be going throughout history and we're going to be going all around the planet to look how individuals have used art um, to hold, communicate, reinforce, and share their own personal beliefs um, about their place in the universe, um, their relationship to others, and their relationship to themselves. So hopefully, as we go on this tour today, it will give you a chance to think about your own beliefs and maybe learn some new ideas and new concepts and take a little deeper interest and a deeper little look into um, what, what sorts of beliefs you hold dear. And to start us off, Deb is going to take us way, way back several millennia. So Deb, please introduce us to this piece. Thanks, Kathleen. Yes, this is way, way back. Now let's begin our presentation by looking at two objects from our ancient Egyptian galleries. And you know, they're located on the first floor of our museum. The ancient Egyptians practiced a type of religion known as polytheism, which is defined as the worship of many gods. They worshiped over 2,000 different gods and goddesses, and they visualized their deities in a variety of ways. Animals were important in the religious life of ancient Egyptians. Respect and veneration for animals played a fundamental role in all of their traditions. They believed that many of their gods and goddesses were reincarnated as animals on earth. And so they created sculptures that depicted many of their gods in animal form. This small sculpture is called the Falcon of Horus. It's 16 inches tall, it's made of bronze, and it's an image of divine kingship. Here's the mythological story of Horus. This tells us the following. Horus was one of the most significant of all the Egyptian deities. He was the son of the goddess Isis and the son of the god Osiris, who was Egypt's first pharaoh and king. But Osiris was killed by his jealous brother, Seth, because Seth wanted to capture the throne. Isis, in order to avenge her husband or Osiris' death, she took on the form of a sparrow hawk. She fanned her wings over Osiris' body and breathed new life into him. Then she gave birth to Horus. Osiris became the god of the underworld, and he remained there as a powerful deity. So, as the story continues, for 80 years, Horus and Seth became locked in a power struggle to claim the throne. Finally, they asked the tribunal of the most powerful gods to judge who the, whom the next pharaoh would be. But they were not able to find a verdict. So that tribunal went to Osiris. Well, Osiris, he was the father of Horus. Of course, he's going to say, I want Horus to be the next king. And if you don't do that, I will send demons to the realm of the gods. So Horus became the next pharaoh and sky god and the ruler of all gods on earth. 
Seth, he was taken away in chains and he conceded his claim to the throne. Now, Horus is depicted as a falcon or as a man with a falcon head. Our falcon portrays Horus wearing a crown of upper and lower Egypt, signifying his divine rule over the entire kingdom. This sculpture would have been commissioned by a king or a very wealthy person and would have been placed in his or her tomb. Now, here are a few additional views of this sculpture. Now, take a look at that. We see the back and we see a side view. Kathleen, if you look at the left image of this, do you notice anything? Well, I'm a, the statue looks like it's hollow. Isn't that a big hole down underneath his tail there? You're right. That's exactly what that is. That is a hole underneath that tail. And yes, you're right. That brown sculpture is hollow. And you know why? Remember, falcons were considered to be very, very sacred to the Egyptians. So they took a mummified bird, a mummified falcon, and they put it in that container. It acted as a receptacle. So now we have the deceased alone in this tomb. We have the sacred, we have the sacred falcon, and this statue becomes a sacred container. Okay. Now, let's move on, and we're going to take a look at another sculpture from Egypt that at this time is associated with a goddess. Cats in ancient Egypt were highly revered. They protected crops, killed vermin, and they slowed the spread of disease. Bast, also called Bastet, was the goddess of love, of sex, and fertility. She was also an ally of the sun. Her father was Ra, the creator of the, uh, the creator sun god, and her mother was Isis, the mother of all the gods. This is a small sculpture, and it's called the Sacred Cat of Bast. It's made out of bronze. It measures 13 inches tall, and it was created in the 7th or 6th century BCE. Originally, Bastet was shown as a very fierce lioness but her gentle nature and her natural grace prompted ancient Egyptians to change her symbol and depict, depict her as a domesticated cat or a cat-headed woman. The Egyptians saw that cats were tender, but they were also seen as being fiercely protective of their young. And so Bastet became known as the personification of the soul of Isis, the goddess of childbirth, and the protector of the home. Cats of royalty were in some instances dressed in gold and jewelry, and they were allowed to eat from the plates of their owners. That sounds kind of familiar. When, when they died, cats were mummified and they were placed in their tombs. It's very likely that this sculpture sat in the tomb of a prominent Egyptian many years ago. Christine, are there any questions? There was one question on the first piece, Deb. Um, the color seemed to have changed from the first slide to the second slides. And the viewer was wondering uh, which is more accurate to how it actually looks in the galleries. Um, I believe, I believe. Hmm. This, I see how this one's a little gold. Yeah, it's gold and there's a little green. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe it looks like that in the galleries. It, I think it depends on the light, really. It really does. It really does depend on the light. And we're just looking at different views here mm -hmm. and you know, photographs of them. Yeah. Um, but uh, regard, it, I do believe it's, you know, it's got some color into it, but it's mm -hmm. magnificent. Without it? high light on it, I really think it looks like these two slides, don't yeah. you? Without highlight, right. Yeah. But it is a beautiful sculpture. Just Absolutely. Beautiful. And how big is it? That uh, is uh, 16 inches tall by 13 wide by uh, 7 deep. Okay, so it's it's uh, you could actually pick it up and hold it. Oh, yes. Yes. It's only about this big. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then Thank a little you. falcon would sit inside. What would sit inside? A falcon remains would sit. Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, and mummified. And mummified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to move on uh, to uh, Kathleen. She's going to present some 
very wonderful sculptures and still in ancient uh, art. Kathleen? Thanks, Jen. I, I, I liked, I enjoyed your presentation very much. But we are going to go from your um, cute little falcon and cat to these life-size statues. Uh, both of these uh, sculptures are life-size. They're made out of marble. And these are Roman copies of original Greek uh, sculptures that went back to about the 5th century BCE. Um, the original Greek would have been made out of bronze, and then when the Romans pretty much adopted so much, so many components of the Greek civilization into their own, they made these copies in marble. And um, the sculpture on the left is a woman, obviously, and the sculpture on the left is a man. And unlike the Egyptian uh, deities, the Greeks and the Romans almost always show their deities in human form, but not just any human form, idealized, perfect human forms. Uh, they thought that the, um, the, the Greek and the Roman gods and goddesses were part of their daily lives. That they came down to earth and they walked among them. They had temples, they worshiped them, but again, they were always the epitome of the human form. So over on the right, we have Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And this is Aphrodite, the, geni the Venus of Genitrix. And I'm sorry, Ray, I said the right. Of course, it's over on the left. And as I said, this is a first century copy of um, a much older bronze statue. Now, some of you may be wondering, okay, this sculpture, there's no head, there's no arms. How on earth do, can we say with any authority that this is Aphrodite? Well, the original bronze sculpture was um, very famous. Small versions were made of it. And actually there were Roman coins that had the image of the complete sculpture on the back of them. So people would have been very, very aware of who this was. And you see how her left arm is kind of coming down and is extending forward. In the original version, in this hand, um, Aphrodite was holding a golden apple. The golden apple was the prize she won during the judgment of poor Paris. When poor Paris, who was human, was forced to judge a beauty contest between Aphrodite, the goddess of love, Juno, the mother of the gods, and um, Athena, who was the goddess of wisdom. And Paris was put in a terrible, terrible predicament, but he decided that Aphrodite was the most beautiful and she won the golden apple. And that was included in the original. Now, as I said, the original was made out of bronze. And it's like, well, what would happen to the original? Well, the bronze statues from the Greek civilizations probably all would have been melted down at some point to make weapons for the various wars that uh, the different Greek societies were involved with. So when the Romans made copies of these Greek originals, they carved them out of marble. And look at the craftsmanship that would have gone into this statue of Aphrodite. She obviously has a very female form with, with the curves accentuated. And she's just wearing this outfit of the finest, purest, um, material that's cascading down over her shoulder. It's almost transparent. It flows down and it accentuates her womanly shape. And yet it is carved out of cold, hard marble. Over on the right now, we're going to look at the male. And this is um, Apollo. And Apollo was one of the most popular gods. He was a god of light and music and prophecy and healing and he was also the god of the hunt. And we can see this because if you look closely at Apollo, you can see there's a strap that's going, yeah, right there. Thanks, Ray. A strap going across his chest. And this is a sign that this is Apollo because that strap would have been connected to a quiver that would have been full of arrows. And what we don't know is if the quiver was actually carved at one point. We don't know if the quiver was maybe made of real material, if it was an actual quiver that, that he wore. Now, when we look at these statues and we see the white marble, we think how, how beautiful they are. And again, we, we admire the craftsmanship. I mean, look at the cloak that's you know kind of cast aside there at Apollo. And again, the graceful curves that are made out of pure hard marble. But these statues would have been painted in their day. 
they would have been painted all over with very vivid colors um, and they would have been placed in places of worship and sometimes real clothing might have been uh, adorning these statues for certain um, holidays. Now, one question we get often is so many of these um, ancient statues that come to us, the sculptures that have survived, that come from uh, you know, the, the first century or so, they all seem to be defaced in almost the exact same way. Their heads are gone and their limbs are gone. And it's like, were they fragile? Were they not made correctly? Well, well no, there's a couple explanations for that. Um, when uh, people who did not share the Greek and uh, Roman religious you know, belief system and you know, saw these people as gods, came across these sculptures, and as I've said a couple of times, I think they would find them in palaces, or they would find them in temples. And these outsiders would realize that these were obviously objects of veneration. And in some belief systems, there was fear that these sculptures themselves actually possessed some kind of spiritual power or some kind of special powers. And so there was great concern about this. And the belief was that if you took and knocked the head off and knocked the arms off and in the case of poor Apollo took off both of his legs, you would dissipate, you would get rid of the power that any of these actual objects might hold. And this held true, like for instance, of like the busts or statues of the emperors. Conquering armories, our armies would take those statues and they would pulverize them and just scatter the stones throughout. However, there's another reason that more modern reason why a lot of these statues don't have heads. And that is because when these sculptures were rediscovered, um, thieves found out that removing the head and thus coming up with a very portable treasure was very profitable in that collectors and, and antiquarians would readily buy the head of a statue and that way the thief didn't have to worry or concern about, concern themselves about the state of the original sculpture uh, or try to excavate it or try to move the entire thing. Um, but anyways, we are very fortunate to have these two sculptures in our collection. They're right on the second floor and they are just so, you know, so beautiful to look at. And fortunately, we don't know where their heads are. We don't know where their arms are. Um, but again, we are fortunate to have the parts of these sculptures that have come down to us. Um, Christine, are there any questions about this? Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, that was a really nice explanation of why everything comes to us in fragments. It's so difficult to, to find a fully intact piece, um, and, and it's rare to find a fully intact piece. Um, you only had a few comments uh, um, that, you know, the, these um, this culture, uh, intriguing, very deep in, in their thinking and um, in the execution of, of the... Um, works that they made. So um, much appreciated viewers today. And then also, I think these um, oftentimes would have been painted back in antiquity too. So we see them as white and we think they were meant to be white or, or bare marble, but they actually could have been brightly painted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, traces of uh, paint are found on, on almost all the specimens that we see. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, thank Great. you. Thanks, Christine. Um, now, Deb is going to take us and show us something representative of another religion that was founded in antiquity. So, Deb, please take it away. Kathleen, that was a wonderful conversation. And thank you for telling us where those heads, how those heads all came off these statues. We always wonder about that. Now we know. Thank you. Well, yes, this dramatic work depicts two very well-known characters from the Hebrew Bible, Samson and Delilah. I'm sure you've heard of them. Their story is recorded in the Book of Judges. These images contrast the strength of the male with the very seductive charms of the female, his beguiler. The mighty Samson was a judge who rescued the people of Israel from Philistine oppression. He was endowed by God with a Herculean strength, and he was willing to fight the Philistines on his own. 
But while Samson was strong in body, unfortunately, he was weak in character and he fell in love with the enemy, a beautiful Philistine woman named Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines asked Delilah to help them discover the source of his great strength. They wanted to know how he came to be so strong. And they said to her this, if you tell us and you find this out, we will pay you 1,100 silver coins. So when Samson finally told Delilah that his strength lay in his, lay in his hair, he waited until he fell asleep. She cut off his hair, and then she called in the Philistines. They barged into her chamber, gouged out Samson's eyes, and took him to prison. Can we see the next slide, please? Here is a picture that we have in our Italian galleries. At, and you can see this live if you go to the museum. It's by the artist Pompeo Bettoni. And he depicts this part of the story. You can see it right there. There's poor Samson laying down on the floor. Look at, look at the very bottom of the painting. You see his hair all on the floor. And her scissors, the scissors are in her hand. And here she is, Delilah, sitting on the bed and waving to these cap, these Philistines who are going to take him away. Okay, next slide, please. While Samson was in prison, his hair continued to grow. One day, he was brought before a great crowd of Philistines who gathered in the temple because they were going to celebrate his capture. He leaned against the pillars of the temple and he prayed to God for his strength. He prayed to God for strength one more, once more to defeat these Philistines. And then he used all his might to push down the pillars of the temple. And in doing so, those pillars came down, the temple came down, killed Samson, but killed thousands of the Philistines inside. The Israelites were then freed from Philistine rule. The American artist, Elihu Vedder, created these two images. They consist of oil on wood panels and they hang high in the American galleries. Samson is portrayed as a strong, handsome man. Take a look at him. You know who he reminds me of? Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger for some reason. <laughs> notice, notice his flowing hair and the rope that's around his neck. That's the rope that the captors use to get him. The beautiful seductress Delilah gazes at Samson behind those curtains after she accepts the money and betrays him. What makes these two works of art so unique, though, are the gold frames that were designed by the artist himself and executed by an Italian frame master. They include biblical motifs from the story of Samson and Delilah. Let's take a look at this in close-up. Okay, let's start at the upper left corner, and we can see there's a lion there. That is the lion that Samson killed earlier in the story with his own bare hands. Then right next to that line are three bees. Those bees produced, they went into the carcass of that lion and they produced honey. Now over to the right on the upper right is a jawbone of the ass that Samson used that jawbone to kill many of the Philistines earlier in the story. And then in the upper corner there is a millstone. He used that to grind grain when he was in prison in the Philistine prison. Now, if you go down to the very bottom of the frame, right in the center, you see the scissors, the scissors that were used to cut his hair and render him helpless. And all around the scissors are the coins, the coins that Delilah received from the Philistines, the silver coins that she used to betray him. Around, uh, on either side of, these, of this frame are pillars. You can see how they look like they're cracked. On the right and the left, those are the pillars that Samson broke down to kill all the Philistines and to free the Israelites. And around the perimeter of the frame, you can see the rope, the rope that was used to capture Samson. Right up on the very top are, is a Hebrew word. And they're different on either frame because that says Samson and the other frame says Delilah in Hebrew. This work was made in 1886. It hung in a private collection and was then presented as a gift to the DIA in 1994. 
Christine, are there any questions? There was a comment about the story and how one of the viewers um, said that they really didn't know the whole story that you just told about Delilah actually not only betraying him, but, um, you know, taking money for doing it. Yes. Uh, and there is also a, a comment um, the viewer was wanting to know more about the frame. So I'm sure that they're very appreciative that you did that very specific explanation of, of this beautiful and well thought out uh, frame that Vetter did. Um, and the Hebrew at the top, uh, yes, this one says Samson and it would be read from right to left. Yes, thank you. All right, now we are going to see an extraordinary garment and Kathleen's going to show this garment to us. Kathleen? Thank you, Deb. And it's interesting that you see Arnold Schwarzenegger. I always thought he looked like a rather swarthy Fabio, but I <laughs> that too. <laughs> <laughs> to move along here, this is an extraordinary object, as Deb said. Um, this is a warrior's tunic. And um, over on the left, we see a back view of the tunic that we can see the front of the tunic on the right, along with the rest of the objects that kind of make up this entire ensemble. So on the upper right, we see a long switch that's sort of been used to um, by a king or someone of royalty uh, to shoo bugs away and to just kind of um, draw attention to themselves, I guess you could say. Up at the top, there's a skull cap type of hat. And then um, immediately to the right of the tunic, there's a very large pouch. And not 100% sure what would go in there, but if you look at the very bottom of the pouch, there are three very fearful either teeth or claws. I honestly don't know what they are. They could be like maybe from a crocodile or um, a wild uh, animal or something. But um, as, as Deb said, this object, this outfit is extraordinary because of all this detail. But it's also extraordinary because this outfit embodies multiple belief systems. So let's take a look at this. So this would have been worn probably by a king, um, at the very least a very, very well-known famous warrior, uh, who would have been a member of the Asante culture. And the Asante is a civilization in Africa that was centered around where modern day Ghana is. And when we look at the tunic front and back, we can see it's a pretty distinctive brown color. And when this tunic was first created, it was first woven, it was then dipped into a mixture of very specific herbs and plants to create this specific brown color. That would have been a first layer of protection, um, according to the Asante belief system, in that these various plants would have been chosen because they provided strength and protection for the wearer. So right off the bat, just the color of the tunic is one layer of protection and one belief system. The next thing to look at is all of the objects that have been sewn onto the uh, tunic, both front and back. These are all little amulets or little containers, or you might call them wallets. Um, most of them are made out of leather, but there are some made of other materials. There's one made of shaved wood. And if you look on the image on the right, you can see that there are at least a couple made out of animal skins. And these would have been sewn on one at a time. And many of them contain, again, special plants or herbs that are thought to provide protection. There might be special stones. There might be precious stones. It could be seashells. Um, they might even be like the skeletons or feathers from birds who were thought to be emissaries to the gods or small an animals, other type of small animals or even fish that, again, were thought to bring protection to the wearer. And that's one of the things you'll find in these um, pouches and amulets. Another thing, though, that's interesting is that you might find passages from the Quran included. And the Quran, of course, is the holy book of Islam. And Islam would have been brought down into uh, Africa during the seventh century by traders and travelers from the Middle East. And like many indigenous cultures, um, the Asante culture absorbed 
elements of Western and Middle Eastern and Eastern religions into the practice and belief systems that they already held. And most cultures in Africa did not have written alphabets. So there was another layer of reverence for anything written, the written word. And so as the, the power of the Quran and the belief in Islam kind of permeated the Asante culture, um, again, passages would be written out in Arabic and they would be sealed within these amulets, which would then be attached to the tunic. Um, a third level of protection would be ancestor worship because this tunic would have been passed down from generation to generation, from king to king. And almost all the cultures in Africa did participate in certain forms of ancestor worship. And so as these amulets would have been added um, over the years, the strength and the wisdom of the ancestors would have been passed down along with the protective powers. And so all together, this brings together um, multiple belief systems, specifically the Asante culture, generally uh, Islam, the Korean protection, and then of course, ancestor worship. And um, just, just how beautifully they've all been incorporated into create this wonderful outward showing of protection and um, assistance for the king. Now, unfortunately, you cannot see this. It is not on display right now. Because it's made out of cloth and it's made out of natural materials, you can imagine how delicate it is. And all of our cloth and natural substances, they're so susceptible to wear and tear from the light, from the atmosphere, that these are usually kept under lock and key. And I personally have never seen them, but Deb, you said you've seen them before, right? I did see them several years ago, yes. And it was uh, amazing, amazing at the work that went into this and the meaning behind it as well. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully someday you can all come down and join me and we can take a good look at this in person. Um, Christine, do we have any questions? No, not specifically, but um, in regard to rotation, you know, our curator in the African gallery is Dr. Ni Corcopone. Mm -hmm. He loves this. Um, he's actually from Ghana, and, uh, and he said it's very rare that all of these individual pieces would be held together over time. And we have the complete ensemble, you know, which is so rare. But he did put it um, away to rest for a little while. But because he, he really um, has a soft spot for, for this ensemble, um, I'm sure it, that it'll be out, you know, probably um, soon again. Well, I hope so. I hope right. so. Do we know how much it weighs? No, I, I didn't have that. Um, I don't know how much of the amulets are. But, um... I, I have no idea what the weight is. A viewer would like to know, but I, I'm not sure. Um, I know that the cloth is, um, you know, has a nice heavy weight to it because it was, uh, as you talked about, preserved and oiled and, you know, they put protective herbs and um, substances on that tunic to protect the warrior um, in warfare. So, um, yeah, well, it, it has some weight to it. Yeah, it has to be kind of hefty to support you know, all those ambulates too that have things. Mm -hmm. But no, right off the bat, I, I I can't even begin to guess how much. But I'd love to see it in action. Yeah, that's oh, a question for our curator. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, Christine. I guess we're going to move along now. Deb, you've got some more sculpture for us, but on a rather minuscule scale. So. Thank you. I have some exquisite works of art right now. I have to love them. Uh, they're made of elephant ivory. And this particular piece is called a diptych. A diptych is a painting or a carving on two inch panels that can be folded together like a book. The diptych, this diptych was carved in France uh, by an unknown artist, most likely in a professional workshop in the first half of the 14th century. The influx of ivory into France during the Middle Ages was the result of active Mediterranean trade during and following the Crusades. 
Elephant ivory was a rare, expensive material and its density allowed for fine carving in elaborate detail. Because of these qualities, ivory soon became the dominant material for luxury items in the Western Europe. The Middle Ages were referred to as the era of private devotion. Diptychs like this were small objects that provided visual Im imagery for prayer and contemplation. This particular diptych is 10 inches high and each one of these two panels measures five inches wide. So here you have your own little personal prayer book. It's 10 by 10, but when you close it, you have a lovely prayer book. Uh, and who carried these? The clergy or very wealthy laity who could afford them, use them as they needed or desired. Now, this is a wonderful prayer book because when you open it, you see 14 different scenes depicting the life of Jesus and Mary. Mary, you know, she occupied a very central role in late medieval spirituality. We did not, uh, they did not worship her, but she was seen as an accessible figure to the ones who, to, you know, to Jesus. So people could pray to her to help them. Now, this diptych is divided into six registers that can be read from the bottom to the top and from left to right across both of the leaves. Now, we'll take a look at this. You see in between, there are moldings, little moldings with roses that separate each one of the registers. Now, it's, we start at the very bottom because that's where you begin. And you see two scenes on the bottom. The one scene is the angel. It's called the, the uh, Annunciation. The angel appears to Mary and he tells her she's going to be the mother of Jesus. To the right of that, you see two women talking. That's called the Visitation. And that is where Mary and her cousin Elizabeth are meeting and telling each other that they're going to have a baby. And look at Mary pointing to her, her abdomen right down low. She's saying, I'm going to have a baby. So we know what that means. Now, to the left of that are three scenes jammed into that, I should say crammed into that one uh, um, register. To the left, we see the Annunciation to the Shepherds. That's the angel coming to the shepherds and telling them, follow the star, follow the star. And then you see in the middle, the nativity. Mary gives birth to Jesus. To the right you see of that, you see the adoration of the Magi. Now, if we go into the middle register to the left, we see the presentation in the temple. That's where Jesus comes. Mary and Joseph bring their baby Jesus to the temple to be blessed. And if you go to the right of that, you see a young boy standing among the very smart doctors in the temple. And he's telling them, you know, uh, he's teaching them instead of them teaching him. They're amazed by him. Now to the left, to the right, if you move over, you will see the wedding at Cana. That is where Jesus transforms the water into wine. And to the right of that, you see the Last Supper, where Jesus and his apostles have bread and bless everything. And this is right before Jesus is crucified. Now, if you go up to the very top register on the left, you see the crucifixion. And in the middle of that, you see the resurrection. Now, let's stop right there because you see Jesus coming out of the grave. But just down to the left of that, you see a little figure to the left. You see a little figure standing there holding on to that coffin. Holding on to that. And that's John. That is the Apostle John. And this is French Gothic art. And they were starting to show, to display emotion in French Gothic art. So you see this man holding on to the crypt and he's crying. Now, to the very right, you see Jesus, the Ascension. He's, he's uh, rising into heaven. And take a look at his feet. That's how you know he's going up to heaven. <laughs> and that, I always think that's a little amusing. Uh, now to the very right of that, you see uh, the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles at Pentecost. 
And the very last scene you see is the crowning of Mary. Traces of color still remain on the corners of this piece. Also, because the carvers cut across the grain of the ivory, along the grain of the ivory, we can just make out the curve. See the curve at the very top in the middle between those two uh, uh, pieces of ivory? We see how it curves. Along with other diptychs, this piece can be found in the glass case, in the spine in the main hall, just outside the medieval Renaissance galleries. This is the most important Gothic ivory carving in our collection at the DIA, and it stands firmly at, among the masterpieces of its period. But as we now know, desire for items of elephant ivory became so popular that poaching led to near extinction of the African elephant. And so the DIA no longer acquires works of this type of material. Okay, now let's move on to another piece of ivory. Well, this one is daunting and it's only three inches high by about an inch and a half in diameter. Take a look at this. It's another exceptional ivory. The repetition of prayers was important, an important part of late medieval devotion. Strings of beads that were made to assist those praying long sequences of prayers are known as rosaries. Rosaries became popular in the 14th century, particularly as a devotion to Mary. A shorter string of devotional beads is called a chaplet. This small bead is only three inches high, as I said, and it served as the pendant at the end of the rosary or chaplet. It conveyed one of the most profound themes of the late Middle Ages, memento mori, a reminder of the transitory nature of life in the, and the inevitability of death. Now we see here that the pendant, this pendant has two sides, two faces on one pendant. On the one side, on the left, you see a death mask. And that's meant to evoke pity. It's got sagging skin over its sunken cheeks, bulging eyes, half-closed eyes, and a very slack jaw. When you see it in person, and I want you to do this too because you will love it, you'll see two small front teeth right under its parted lips. Now the other side, whoa, that is a gruesome skull, and that evokes terror. Take a look at Oh, uh, the fiendish grin, the slithering vermin all around its head. And take a look at that lizard. It's underneath its jaw and it's coming out of its mouth. How, how awful is that? Now, right around the, the collar of this figure is an inscription in Latin. It says, Omoris quam amara a memoria tua. And that translates to, O death, how bitter it is to be reminded of you. And this, these people were reminded of death all of the time because remember, this is a time of the plagues, plague after plague, completely uh, wiped out many areas of Europe for many hundreds of years, starting in the 1300s, then the 1500s and the 1600s, many people died from bubonic plague called Black Death. This pendant is on display in the Gothic Hall, and it's just steps away from the French chapel. Traces of color still exist on the bead, and like the diptych, this object was used by church officials or by a very wealthy person. Now, Kathleen, I'm sorry, I would not want to be saying the rosary with this. Maybe on Halloween, but that'd be about it. Yeah. I would be terrified. Yeah. Well, Christine, are there any questions? Deb, thanks for that in-depth. And this piece is so tiny. I'm sure that thousands of people walk by it every day and they don't even notice that it's in the case. It's magnificent. And to think that somebody could, could carve this like this, all the detail. I love this piece, even though it is gruesome. Well, it certainly is, uh, what, you know, what we call a memento mori or reminding us that... Uh, 
life is transient and we're we're all uh, headed in the same direction. That's right. Um, that's right. Uh, there was a question on the um, diptych about the hinges as to whether they were uh, original to the piece. And do we know anything about the hinges? I can't tell you too much about the hinges, but I do know they were original to the piece. And they had to be because, again, this was meant to be very portable, a wonderful little prayer book for somebody who could afford to buy it. So he could take it, put it in his cloak, put it in his backpack or sack, and open it up and pray, pray when they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And then on this one too, now the, the picture's back up there. You know, it's made out of an elephant tusk, the ivory from yes. Africa, a trade item. And you can see at the very top um, the, curve. The, the curve, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. And, and, even this, and these pieces were made in great number in, mm -hmm. in a workshop. But I just can't imagine... Even though they were easy to carve, think of the detail yeah. of that. Amazing to me. Well, you know that, I mean, elephant ivory is prohibited now, um, yep. but part of the allure of it back in the day was, um, you know, how buttery it was and easy it was to carve yeah. for, for the carvers of the time. Um, but 14 and, different seeds. This is what makes this particular one a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. People need to yeah. see this. It's, it's exquisite. Yes. Um, there's a question as to how we acquired this piece. I don't really know, but um, I, I, can, I can mention that, you know, we don't acquire pieces like this anymore. No. Um, these, uh, the African uh, ivory pieces, the elephant ivory is not bought and sold on the market. Uh, elephants are protected. And so we have what we have, but we don't... Um, you know, we, we don't um, uh, buy and sell in um, ivory anymore. Not at all. Not at all. All right, Kathleen. Now she's going to take us over to India, right, Kathleen? Uh, nope, not just. Oh, I'm not. sorry. <laughs> First, you're going to kind of go from the uh, grotesque to the sublime. Look at this gorgeous mother and child, this Madonna piece. Um, that dates from about the middle of the 17th century. It's in our Italian galleries. It was painted by uh, Benoso Ghazali. And in this piece, we see Mary and Jesus from the Christian religion just at, at they're, they're being venerated. They're, they're up in heaven and they're just being celebrated. Look at Mary and look at her dress, her underdress. It looks like it's made out of woven gold. There are um, gemstones right there along her neckline. Thank you, Ray. There are gemstones at the sleeves um, on her, both of her wrists. She is wearing this sumptuous blue cloak. And blue, of course, is the color of royalty here on Earth. Um, if you look at the cloak, um, you can see it's lined with ermine. So Mary is dressed as just you know, the richest queen, the most elegant queen in the world. And she has a big golden halo going all around her head, which says Ave Maria um, Gracia Plena, which is Hail Mary, full of grace. And she is looking with a very uh, serene, aristocratic, beautifully refined face. She's gazing at Jesus, her baby, who she's holding in her arms. And you can see she has very long aristocratic fingers of her uh, left hand so carefully supporting Jesus and her other hand kind of enveloping him with the cloak. When we look at Jesus, we see that he too is dressed in very fine garments. And if we look down, he the bottom half, he is draped in red velvet, perhaps, red satin. And red, of course, is the color of the divine. So we have the blue for royalty the red for divine, and Jesus too has his blonde curls and a golden halo, uh, golden halo. and that's kind of a, a Latinized Greek that are the, the letters that spell out, you know, Jesus Christ, as in the Savior. And if you look at Jesus's right hand, he's holding it up, his two little fingers, and whenever you see Jesus depicted with holding up two fingers, that's to remind viewers of his dual nature 
in that, yes, he is the son of God. He is a God, but he was born of a human woman. So that's his two natures. He is man and God at the same time. Now, obviously, this is Mary and Jesus being glorified in heaven. And what about the passion of Christ? What about all the horrible pain and suffering Jesus went through when he was uh, captured and he was scourged and then he was um, crucified and all that horrible, horrible things that happened to him? And what about Mary's profound grief? Well, they're not really talking about that too much in this painting except there is one very tiny allusion to it. If you look at Jesus's left hand, right below Mary's fingers, he's holding a tiny, tiny little bird. And this is just, it's its little, um, oh, uh, it's a bird that likes to eat thorns and live within the thorns and the thistles. And this is a reminder of Jesus's suffering that is going to come. Um, it's, it is a very subtle, almost hidden, you know, amongst all the rest of the sumptuous color in there, but it is a reminder of the passion and what Jesus is going to go to. And of course, Mary's great grief at watching these things happen to her son, that little goldfinch that he's holding. And then, of course, we see in the background, we see all these figures. And yeah, Ray, if you stop on that blue seraphim, these are angels, seraphim. They're a high rank of, of uh, angels. And we can tell that they're seraphim because they have two sets of wings. Yeah, right there, you can see they've got the shoulder wings coming off, and then they have other wings shooting up here. So seraphim are a high rank of angels, and they stay in heaven, and they're in give perpetual worship to Jesus and God and honor to Mary. And just a couple of things. If you look at Mary's right shoulder, right there, you'll see this little like kind of spidery star symbol. And the next time you're at the museum or you're in any museum and you're looking at Renaissance Madonnas, check to see how often this star symbol will appear because that's a symbol that Mary is indeed the queen of the seven seas. So we have the blue representing royalty on earth. So Mary is the queen of earth. We have the red representing the divine. So Mary is the queen of heaven. And then we have the star reminding us that she is the queen of the seven seas. So this is Mary resplendent, the queen of all she sees. Now, something else about this. I have been touring this and um, it's, People will sometimes comment, this looks a little claustrophobic. It looks like, you know, all this art and all this grandeur has been compressed into this rather smallish painting. That's because we do know at some fact this painting was much larger. Uh, we don't know who or when or why it was cut down. Presumably it was cut down so it would fit into a smaller space. But originally this was a very, it was a much larger painting. And um, it would not have been hung out in a public place. This is the sort of painting that would have been found probably in like maybe a side altar or a side chapel for members of the uh, clergy to gaze on this. Because this is tempera paint and it's on um, wood. And whoever commissioned this had a lot of money because that's pure gold leaf that we see represented and brushed throughout the painting. And to get those vivid red and um, blue colors, they would have had to use crushed gemstones mixed into the tempera mixture, uh, probably blue for the lapis lazuli and for the red, probably a variety of gemstones. But this, this Madonna and Child by Gazzoli is in our Italian gallery and it is just beautiful and just as vibrant as you can see. Um, now, Ray, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Now, here we have another mother and child. And this is a different type of portrayal. But again, it, it harkens to the uh, previous Madonna. Absolutely. This is called Black Mother and Child, and it was painted in 1970 by an African-American artist whose name is Romare Bearden. And Bearden was brought up in the church, so he would have been familiar with the New Testament, and he would have been familiar with the relationship between Mary and um, her son, Jesus. 
But Bearden had also been very active in civil rights during the 1960s. And so he, he would he took great pains trying to capture and portray and share um, the humanity and the natural um, relationship of uh, Black history and Black families. So here, again, we have the mother. She has kind of that stoic, aristocratic face, but it's not painted, okay? Bearden was a collagist. And, and when a collage is when you cut up and take different materials and you then piece them back together, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, only with a little bit more finesse, uh, to create a, a new uh, create an art piece here. And uh, what Bearden used for this particular uh, painting or collage is he used glossy magazines, like Look and Life and uh, Essence and Ebony, these magazines, because they thought they were more modern to this. But again, when we look at this, we see Mary is wearing uh, a headdress, very similar to what our previous Mary was holding. Um, the biggest difference here, though, is that look at, look at the baby. Look at Jesus. He's not looking out at us. He is gazing adoringly at his mother. You know, just look at the tenderness there. Look at how his little red arms, the one um, comes up around the top on the right, and we see his little hand caressing and encircling Mary's uh, down by her chin. We see his other little red hand, you know, reaching for his mother. And Ray, could we see both of them side by side, please? Next slide. Thank you. So again, look at these. They're essentially painting of the same idea, the, the same theme. Similarities in both of these. The, um, the mother is inclining her head. The mother is supporting the baby. The mother is, is caressing and keeping their child safe. And now look in both of these, we see the colors reflecting. The bright, bright blues of um, royalty on earth and the deep reds, uh, which you know, represent the sacred. And um, just, you know, these are both such loving tributes to um, mothers and babies and the strong bond between them. And unfortunately, I told you that the one by Gazzoli on the left, of course, is on display in our galleries. Um, the one on our right, though, because it's made out of collage and it's made out of um, glossy magazine and paper, this has to be protected. It has to be put to sleep, just like our Asante uh, tunic that was made out of cloth needs to be. And so, unfortunately, this beautiful slide is not on display right now. And... Um, Oh, I wish it was because it's just, it's the tender and loving uh, celebration of kind of the universal idea of the, the mother and the child, you know, going along, going together and, and being just like this. Um, Christine, do we have any questions or comments? Um, we actually don't have any from the viewers, but uh, mm -hmm. the Romare beard and the collage that you just talked about, uh -huh. uh, it, it's uh, thanks for the talk about how the DIA rotates things because we have so many pieces and it's impossible, first of all, to keep them all on display. And second of all, like you mentioned, this piece, this, this collage is paper, so it does need to rest and it does need to go into the dark. Um, also the comparison, it's so interesting. You know, the, the, um, the one was made in the 1600s and the other is made in 1970, but the theme is actually the same. You know, human belief systems in 400 years, you know, haven't changed that much. Yeah, indeed. And you know what? I think it's great that some of these go off view. It gives us an excuse to go down to the DIA again and again and again and find them as they come back on view. It's always a surprise. Absolutely. Even we're surprised working there and being volunteers there, how the art changes All so the time. frequently. Yeah. Well, Deb, I just looked at the clock and I can't believe it, but our time is up. That's too bad. And so we'll have to come back and talk about some more pieces, Seeking the Sacred at another time. 
But um, before we go, I want to thank Deb, of course. Um, and I want to thank Amanda Harrison, who brought us together, and Christine Mark. Thank you, Christine, for the questions. And I'd like to thank our behind the scenes gentleman, Ray Henney, who's been yes. having the slides for us. Thank you, Ray. Yep. And then I'd also like to invite everybody to come back next week. Um, next week, though, it's not going to be um, a docent talk. Next week, we're going to have a film. And it is Fellini's very famous La Strada. And this comes to us from 1952. And it is Anthony Quinn giving the performance of a lifetime. <laughs> so hopefully you'll be um, able to join us next Thursday at 1 o'clock. And until then, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We really hope you enjoyed our presentation today. And we'll see you again. Thanks, Deb. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.